So this is the lecture uh, specifically on the Virgen de Guadalupe. It's part of the other lectures that we have for this quarter, for this class. And the Virgen de Guadalupe will become very useful when we discuss the representations of the human body, particularly as it pertains to gender and to ethnicity. Okay? So here on your left, on your right, excuse me, you can see the painting that we know as Virgen de Guadalupe or Virgin of Guadalupe. Lupe, Guadalupe. It's a 16th century oil and tempera on cloth. It is currently housed at Basilica de Guadalupe in Mexico City. Thousands of faithful come to the Basilica to worship her. This image appeared in a cloak or the mantle, which in Nahuatl, the lingua franca of the Aztecs, is tilma or tilmatl, on the mantle of Juan Diego, on the cloak of Juan Diego. It miraculously appeared. We'll be telling you about the miraculous apparitions. But also, the faithful know that in pre-contact time, which is before 1519 or 1521, which is the year, 1521, the year that Tenochtitlan, the city, uh, Mexico City, or the capital city of the Aztecs, falls. And Spaniards and the Spanish Empire sends a lot of friars to Christianize, to convert many of the indigenous peoples. And many do convert and many continue with traditions and may, many are in between. And that's kind of like the point of this lecture. And Tonantzin means our mother. And it's very important that you keep in mind that Tonantzin, our mother, is female, but often Aztec gods have a male counterpart. So they have male and female, a lot of times they're couples, and the issues of sexuality, issues of morality are very different between the Aztecs and Catholics or Europeans who are identify as Christians or observe Christianity. So her name comes from the monastery of Santa Maria de Guadalupe in a town of Guadalupe in Extremadura, Spain. So she's named after the most important Marian shrines in medieval Cast Castile. And she's one of the many Madonnas of Spain who has dark skin. So you can see they have black skin and you can see her here. So as you can tell, the iconography is not the same, but they do share the fact that they are part of Marian shrines. And that means that it's a place where the faithful go to worship. And specifically, Marian refers, obviously, to the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ in Christianity. And why is she so significant? She's so significant because since birth, Mexicans and Mexican-Americans alike grow up with that image. Her image is ubiquitous. You find her in churches, in shrines, of course, but then also you find her in mural painting, in the museums, at the local market, in newspapers, magazines, adorning anything from earrings to candles, uh, jackets, you name it. She's everywhere, okay? And so that's why I'm telling you that since birth, Mexicans and Mexican-Americans or Chicanx people are born, for the most part, with that image. And she becomes a symbol of bo in, in both in religion, but also in secular context. Because even people who say that they are atheists have a special relationship with this specific image. And I'll, get, I'll go over the iconography briefly right now. So let's look at the list that I wrote here. Symbol of motherly love. A protector of the underdog, and that becomes very significant in both in the context of Catholicism and also in the context of patriotism and, you know, just secular things. Father Miguel Hidalgo, credited with launching the war for Mexico's independence in 1821, independence from Spain, uttered the words, long live the Virgin of Guadalupe, okay? So, so that he uttered those words to make everyone unite in a common cause for this war because Spain was not going to let Mexico or New Spain, as it was known at the time, easily because it was too rich a place to give up. Emiliano Zapata, we discussed him last time, and his soldiers carried her image to battle during the Mexican Revolution. And modern day Zapatistas, who continue fighting for justice, freedom, and land reform in Chiapas and in adjacent regions of Mexico, uh, they're known as Zapatistas, they continue that tradition of associating with her image because of the underdog and motherly love uh, themes in part. 
And the Chica Next people embraced her image in the struggle for so social justice in the 60s and 70s, as, as many of the artworks that we're studying for this week will show. And modern day Chicanx people and Latinx people do as well to protect the plight of immigrants. And I didn't put in here, but also her cult is so widespread in Catholicism that also the people in the Philippines are also devoted to her cult. Okay, so let me tell you something about the authorship. Well, if you ask, depending on who you ask, right? If you ask the devout Catholics who are true believers, they will tell you that this was a miraculous image that appeared in the cloak of Juan Diego. And they will also tell you that it's very much of an indigenous, okay? And if you ask art historians and scholars, they will try to study the painting and tell you that we don't have exact archival information, but we think that in the 1550s, Marco Sipac de Aquino, a native artist from New Spain, made the painting. And Miguel Cabrera, I don't know if you are familiar with his art, but he was a very prominent Zapotec artist. Uh, oh, I didn't write here Zapotec, but uh, he's an indigenous artist, clearly trained, highly trained. Yes? Um, are you supposed to be showing a PowerPoint again? Yes. We oh, can't see. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you see it now? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you, thank you so much, I appreciate it. I guess we were recording. Okay, let me repeat that because you didn't see it. So the, can you see it now? Yes. Thank you, I'll, I'll erase what I, <laughs> if you want me to. Uh, so if I ask you a question, just say yes or no, nobody will know who said it because I actually erased your names from the side because the, la the first lecture, there, was, there were names, so I couldn't post it. And I must guard your right to privacy. Anyway, okay, so the authorship, and I'll go quickly because you, you heard it, but the authorship, depending on who you ask, if you ask the faithful Catholic or, or believers, I should say, it's a miraculous apparition and also it's miraculous how the this image appeared in the cloak of Juan Diego and also it's a very much part of this cult is that the, the whole thing has origin in indigenous peoples but if you are art historians or scholars they will begin analyzing the painting and in terms of style in terms of materiality they will tell you a specific origin that can be traced historically most of the evidence, some of the evidence shows that in the 1550s, so not in 1531, because of the apparition, I'll tell you that in a second, is from 1531. So in the 1550s, scholars see that Marco Sipac de Aquino, a native artist from New Spain, made this painting. And Miguel Cabrera, a Zapotec artist, he was studying this painting in 1751. You might know this very important artist from Mexico, the 1700s, that's the 18th century. Miguel Cabrera, he, he's uh, known for gorgeous religious paintings. This one in particular is from Castas, depicting ethnicities, different ethnicities in 18th century Mexico. But as you can see, he was highly trained at the academy in European art forms. And so he studied the paint, studied this painting with other artists at the academy, and they identified techniques that the artists use in the painting, including oil, which they, mixed with tempera and, and they applied a thin layer on the face and the skin to add luminescent to these olive undertones on the virgin. And they use tempera with agglutinase applied directly to the underpaint and the underpaint is the, they took the cloth and then they added a whole layer of white and that's the ground or it's also called sizing. So tempera with agglutinase are applied to the background. And then aguaso, another technique that Cabrera and other artists from the Academy in Mexico City detected, is that aguaso is a fresco-like tempera because it requires the dampening of the cloth. So you might know that fresco is thus cold because you have to, as an artist, you have to paint really quickly before the wall dries. So that's what fresco means. You have to, you're painting on wet. And then they detected also gold leaf which goes on the mantles 
and this is her mantle on the stars and then on the trim and also in this sunburst. And I'll go over the iconography quickly in a minute. So therefore, the, is it a miraculous creation? Well, you cannot argue with religion. If you believe it, nobody can argue with you. If God wills it, nobody can argue with you. That's religion. That's the nature of religion. In the academy, in the scholars, scholars, we, in the humanities even, we have to analyze all aspects and we don't go by religious uh, dogma necessarily. So is, uh, the materiality indicates human authorship, obviously, because scholars have detected also normal deterioration due to the passage of time and human handling. And I'll just tell you very quickly because I could go on all quarter talking about this specific image, but some of the things that have been changed would be that sometimes in the 1800s, an artist added more angels all around here. And apparently they're just faded out because they, they just didn't last because they were not high quality. Her fingers were also longer, her hands were larger. And every painting, not just this one, but every artwork in the world, even the Mona Lisa, even the one that you know more, they have to be cared for. And when you're dealing with something very, very old, sometimes there's a lot of upkeep that you have to do, including sometimes putting little, you, you try not to change the integrity of the original, but there's a lot of changes. So this one, there's evidence that it was changed. And just very quickly, I kept explaining about the tempera and how to mix. This painting on your left, Madonna and Child from Duccio, is tempera and gold. And as you can see, tempera, what, what happens in tempera is that it is made based on egg. So it's egg tempera, really. And what happens is that with these type of materials, it dries very quickly. So the artists were not, you can see the dress of the Christ here, they were not able to blend completely because it dries almost as soon as you do the brushstroke, it dries. Whereas in the 1400s, particularly the Netherlandish artists began using oil on panel, or oil on canvas, oil. And what happens is that when you do the brush strokes, you can do a lot of blending and you can do, look at this stunning photo, it's one of my favorites. Look at all the details that you can achieve with oil because you can do so blending and you can do it, come back two days later and it's still wet so that you can to still manipulate the desired qualities that you want in the painting. Now, having said that, those of you who are artists will tell me that you could achieve this somewhat with oil tempera and you would be right. You can achieve a lot of things, but usually what we see is that the oil and tempera was a little bit more difficult just because it dries so quickly in the blending and things. But in the Virgen de Guadalupe, we see both techniques used simultaneously. Now, the iconography. She has dark skin, just like the Madonnas from Spain, as I, I showed you, and dark hair. And that signifies also probably, some scholars think that that is also signifies indigenous, uh, that an indigenous painter or artist made this image. She's wearing a cerulean shawl, which is like aquamarine, decorated with uh, golden stars. And her tunic is somewhat pinkish. It's a brocade and you can see the flowers here and then the smaller flowers and then large flowers. And then the sleeves of her tunic are decorated with fur. And then this black band here signifies maternity. So she is pregnant with Jesus Christ. And this aureola or aura, it's a, an almond or oval shape, sometimes called mandorla as well. It has gilded rays, as you can see here. And adorning also is, is a scalloped cloud around her. The other thing I forgot to put in here is that there is an angel down here and she's floating on a, on a, a crescent moon that is painted in black. And the little angel here is holding her mantles. You can see holding the mantle, but usually he's holding the moon. But in here, it's like, oh no, I actually wrote it here. She rides on the black crescent moon and below it, a winged angel supports the Virgin by holding her garments. Yeah. And a lot of times when you see clouds like this, it signifies 
breaking of glory. And this is what breaking of glory here. You, you see the clouds and the celestial realm to separate the earthly realm with the heavenly. And here God is receiving. This is the Assumption of Mary by Titian. And this is a painting of the Italian High Renaissance. And so all of this is actually having a lot of impact in Mesoamerica. And last thing I'm going to say is that formal studies of the painting has shown that she used to have a crown because over here, she's being crowned as well. A lot of, a lot of the paintings showed uh, the Virgin Mary or whoever uh, in the Assumption is being crowned, has been in heaven now. And she used to have a crown, but people who have analyzed it said that it disappeared. And, and also you cannot see the traces here because of the framing. But here you can see later renditions have the crown. And, she, and this is the frame that she's at. And this is how she appears in the Basilica today. So if you go to the Basilica in Mexico, this is how you will see it. And there's so many of us going that you would be placed in a conveyor belt so that we don't take too long because otherwise art historians and, and, and you know, devout people would be like there for hours <laughs> because you, uh, you cannot stop looking. Uh, but there's a conveyor belt that you have to go stand in line to go see her again. Okie dokie. And besides the origin of the name, in Spain, the image of the Virgin Guadalupe has been linked to Revelation 12:1, which says, a great portent appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and I just explained the sun rays, with the moon under her feet, over here, and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. And that's why I explained to you about the star. And why she's so important? She's so important because I have showed you, giving you specific instances of how important she was in Mexico, but also in Chicanex art. And over here, you've seen these images before from uh, this one on your left from Esther Hernandez, La Virgen de Guadalupe defendiendo los derechos de los Chicanos, or the Virgin of Guadalupe defending the rights of the Chicanos. And in this etching, Hernandez is taking that image and actually having the Virgin practice martial arts in defense of Chicanex people, right? And, and this goes to the original ideas of her cult. And over here, as we explain, and we'll be discussing her, uh, this particular painting in more detail next uh, on Thursday, uh, Alma Lopez's Our Lady from 1999, in which the symbols of the Virgen de Guadalupe are unmistakable. And she caused a lot of controversy, as you uh, saw from the readings, it, when she was exhibited in, in the exhibition in Santa Fe. But we'll talk a little bit about her. now. The origin of the Virgin de Guadalupe is dated to a series of appearances in miraculous events that were reported by these Aztec men, Juan Diego. And one of the things that puzzles historians and art historians is that the story that I'm about to tell you is in a document called Way Tlamahuisoltica, the great event, but it was first published in Mexico in 1649. And I just told you that the first apparition is 1531. And the second section of this document relates, and this is Nikan Mokowa, here is recounted, relates the appearances themselves. So let me tell you quickly about the appearances and then I'll, I'll strap it for questions if you have any. So the upper, first a ship, the Virgen de Guadalupe first appears to Juan Diego, uh, as I told you <laughs> several times, he's an Aztec, on December 9, 1551. And then subsequently three more times she appears, December 10, 11th, and 12th. So Juan Diego sees her in the hill of Tepeyac, and I'll show you in a map. I actually found a great map. I'll show you the hill of Tepeyac. And she spoke to Juan Diego in Nahuatl. So this is very significant. The fact that she has some ethnic barkers of being dark, right, with the hair and the skin, and that she's speaking Nahuatl is very significant. And she introduces herself to Juan Diego as the Virgin Mary. And what she's asking is that the church built her a house so that people can come and petition her or worship her. So Juan Diego did as, as requested and went to the archbishop, who at the time was Juan de Sumarraga, who did not believe the, what Juan Diego was saying. And Sumarraga eventually told Juan Diego to ask the Virgin for a sign. And Juan Diego was a little bit, one time Juan Bernardino, his uncle, fell, fell sick. And Juan Diego did not come because I told you that there's several apparitions here. And then one time, Juan Diego tried to avoid the Virgin. 
and so she took a different route because he was looking for medicine for his uncle Juan Bernardino. So he's like, I know that Virgencita wants to see me and told me she was going to be there, but today I cannot speak with her because I have to find the medicine for my uncle. So she famously, so he takes the alternate route to avoid seeing her, but she actually appears in the path that he does take. And she famously asks him, and, and write this down in your notes, am I not here that I am your mother? And that becomes so significant for Mexican and Mexican Americans alike. And the Virgin at the time became like a protector of the people who are sick, who are in, in trouble. And she's like this very strong motherly figure. She represents the very best of what we think a mother is or a, or a caregiver is. So the Virgin told Juan Diego not to worry about his uncle and to go and gather roses. And this is one of the miracles, you guys. Because in December, roses, as everybody knows, they're not in season. And to place those roses in his tilma, which I told you is now what's for a cloak, and take them to uh, the archbishop, the Sumarraga. So the virgin appears to Juan Bernardino and cures him, by the way. And then Juan Diego is able to go to Sumarraga. And then he opens his cloak, and the flowers, the roses, fall on the floor. And the Virgin of Guadalupe's image appears miraculously on that tilma. And then the Archbishop believes him because he had not been believed for a long time. And on 26th of December, 1531, as adherents of the Catholic Church will tell you, a procession takes the image on the clock to Tepeyac Hill to a chapel built in the Virgin's honor. And just uh, fun facts, in on 12 October, 1895, the Holy See via the papal bull, that's a, a document in which they announced something extremely important from Pope Leo XIII. He granted permission of a canonical coronation of the Virgin's image, proclaiming her Queen of Mexico and patroness of the Americas. So as you can see from 1531 to 1895, that cult becomes even more important. And in 2002, the Catholic Church and the Pope John Paul II canonized Juan Diego as Saint Juan Diego Cuatlatzuatzin, and these are the birth dates. Now, if you ask art historians or historians, there's not enough evidence, necessarily archival evidence, of Juan Diego and of the image of how it was made or, or who made it, who was the author. But many paintings have appeared, for example, this one from the 1700s that is showing God himself painting the image over here that you can see. And you, over here, you can see the crown that was originally there. And originally, Mexico had built, so let me see if it's here, yeah. Over here is where she is right now. And over here is where Cerro de Tepeyac is where the miracles that I just told you occurred. And then, in 1709, they made this basilica. Look how gorgeous it is, this basilica. I've been there a few times. It's gorgeous. It's stunning to go inside. However, La Virgencita or the Virgin de Guadalupe is inside this one. Why? Because this one, it's only like the nave is like this. The nave is where uh, congregants gather to worship, to pray, or to listen to mass. It was just too small. And then the Catholic officials didn't know what to do. And they went to the government thinking they're not going to do anything, but let's go ask anyway. So note to self, always ask, see what happens. And the uh, Mexican government, lo and behold, said, oh yeah, we'll fund your new, the new house for the Virgen. And it's absolutely large. See, it's like almost the whole area, not just this. It's a whole area. And this is where she's at. She will be here. The main sanctuary is here. This is where people congregate. And, and here she is within the conveyor belt, though. And it could house... 10,000 faithful. And here, this is the inauguration of the Basilica, the original one in which she was placed. But again, this was sinking. And also, it couldn't hold the masses of people who came to worship her. And this was Manuel Arellano in 1709. And here it is. And this is a light day. It's probably a weekday, a working day or something, because it's usually really, really crowded. Now, one last thing I'm going to say is that about whether the apparition was true or not, it's up to you to decide. It is 
very important in Chicanx art and also Mexican art. But also, let me say just a couple of things about religion, about religion in colonial New Spain. And New Spain, again, is the place of, uh, you know, the Aztec Empire, as was known, was renamed by the Spaniards starting in 1521. Friars and other Catholic officials tried to convert all Amerindias, basically, and obviously the Aztecs. And Aztecs were forced to convert to Christianity. But it's very important to understand that conversion is very complex. Some Aztecs practiced their pre-contact religion even while becoming devout Christians. So there they were in this state of Nepantla. And I'll explain that in, the, in our discussions of these readings for this week and in subsequent lectures. But sometimes they would practice both. Sometimes they actually, under no circumstances, will they convert to Christianity. And the Chronicle Diego Muñoz Camargo, who was Aztec from Tlaxcala, but also Spanish. His, his father was a Spaniard, but his mother was a noble woman from Tlaxcala. He's showing that in this image, in, his, in the manuscript that he made, uh, over here to your uh, right, you're seeing burning of all uh, costuming elements, books, and accoutrements of the priests that the friars burned. And then also from Diego Muñoz Camarco's Descripción de la Ciudad y Provincia de Tlaxcala, a lot of times it's known as uh, Historia de Tlaxcala, History of Tlaxcala. It's got a lot of text and these images as well. It's showing that over here is a Tlatoani holding a ritual in a cave. And because of that, he was executed by hanging. And over here is showing the 12 friars from the Order of St. Francis erecting the first cross in New Spain, right? And showing the ominous apparition. And this does not resemble the Aztec gods, but you can see this actually, Rohat, I know I recognize some of the iconography, but these uh, flying demon-like uh, beings are actually more in keeping with European iconography. But I can see some icons that they placed to signify that these were Aztec gods and consequently depicted as demons. And many people truly converted. Here we see a baptism of Aztec people. And here's Cortes and Malintzin. Malintzin is a person who translated for Hernán Cortes, the mastermind of the conquest in Mexico in 1521. And Mesoamericans gave Malintzin, now widely known and in Chican, Chicanos, Chicanos uh, realms known as Malinche. Over here, they're attending the baptism of uh, certain people from Tlaxcala. And over here, you're seeing executions of people because over here it says, castigo a los que han ridiculizado nuestra santa fe. Punishment to those who have ridiculed our, our holy faith. So sometimes it would be burned as in here also on your far right. And over here it says, great justice that was made of five caciques. Caciques are actually Tlatoani, those are leaders. Very important leaders of Tlaxcala and a noble woman of that land because from being Christian, they turn idolaters. And two other ones of them were burnt because of their stubbornness. Fertilances, yeah, it's, it's spelled differently in, in this, at this time, but it's a stubbornness or strong-headed. So just to close, pre-Columbian religion continued in the colonial period and even into the 21st century. Indigenous peoples continue to be very important in Mesoamerica and in the United States, excuse me, in Mexico, Central America, and the United States. But nevertheless, Christianity's introduction significantly affected religious thought in, in all of these areas. And the concept of the Pantla becomes extremely important. And Aztec religion also affects religious thought in Europe. Never forget that because we often forget that. Europeans, when they saw the Americas, they were wondering what to do with their beliefs. Where do these people come from? What does the idea of Jesus Christ and the ideas of salvation? But a lot of these you know, inquisition and trying to, to punish people for this, it's not just religion, but it's also a way to be in charge of social norms or morality and philosophy and to control not just religious thought,
but everything else, which a lot of times we, we have a tendency to think of, oh, there's a, a division between church and state, and I'm not sure that that ever happened. And just to close, here's another image from Esther Hernandez. And here we see, it's called La Ofrenda, and it's from the National Chicano Screen Print Taller from 1988, and it's at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. That's where it's housed. And as you can see, it's a female who has a tattoo of the Virgen de Guadalupe. In this case, she's been crowned by two little angels. And the rest of the iconography is very similar. And over here, another person has come and placed an offering in devotion to her. And I think I told you last time that the Judeo-Christian Bible describes the human being as the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so what does that say about this particular image or person? What can we say about it? 